Hey everyone, Mitchell here from New Dawn Aquaculture. In this video, we're gonna talk about a really popular group of corals in the reef aquarium hobby, Micromusa lordhoensis, sometimes referred to as an acan coral. These corals were reclassified to Micromusa from Acanthastria in 2016. You'll still very often hear people refer to them as acans, and every single day we have people coming into the coral farm asking to see where the acans are, so that term is probably here to stay for quite a while longer, but we do our best to try to identify the corals by the correct genus and species. And so going forward, we will refer to them as Micromusa, and I'm gonna explain some reasons why it makes sense to have the proper taxonomy when referring to these corals. Lord Hoensis are not the only coral that this happens to. We also have Homophilia bauer banki, which is a really popular group of LPS corals as well. They used to be referred to as Acanthastria bauerbanki, but were reclassified out around the same time. One of the main reasons why you want to be correct on your coral taxonomy is that it helps you a lot when placing the corals in your aquarium. Micromusa has a couple different species in it. The main one you'll encounter is Lord Hoensis, but you'll also find Amakusensis, Pacifica, and I believe there's at least two more, although you almost never see them in the aquarium hobby. These are corals that will actually get along and grow into a garden fairly well in your aquarium. And the same can be said of Homophilia. You have Homophilia bauerbanki and Homophilia australis, which do very well together in a garden in your aquarium. But the same could not be said of Acanthastria when all of these corals belong to that genus. Acanthastria echinata, which is still a member of Acanthastria, used to be a coral that would sting and kill the Lord Howensis and the Bower Bankies that were placed near in an aquarium. And so even back then, that was a sign that we had the taxonomy wrong. But now, knowing the modern taxonomy, it helps you place these corals in your aquarium with closely related corals of the same genus so that you don't have these aggression problems between the corals in your aquarium. With Micromusa, most of what you're gonna come across in the hobby is Micromusa lordhoensis, which is the topic of this video. You'll also encounter Micromusa amacusensis, which are typically thought of as a smaller polyped Micromusa. And sometimes, but they're fairly uncommon, you'll run into Micromusa pacifica, which are a much larger polyped Micromusa. Although anytime I see stores selling these, they're almost always labeling them as Bauer Bankies instead of Micromusa Pacifica, but they tend to be a lot harder to keep and not do as well for people long term. With Lord Howensis, the vast majority of what you're going to encounter in the hobby is Australian Lord Howensis. We do have a little bit of Indonesian Lord Howensis in the farm, but to be honest, it doesn't hold a candle to the Australian stuff. It seems to grow a little bit slower for us. It's just not as common for a reason. The Australian Lord Howensis is really what most people want. Micromusa Lord Howensis come in a vast array of colors. You'll find single color strains to rainbow colored strains, and they tend to be a very fleshy looking coral when they're happy. They're a great coral for beginners because you can just tell by looking at them how well your aquarium's doing. When they're happy, they get really big and puffy and you can see them swaying around in the current. And when they're unhappy, they'll get sucked right into their skeleton. And so they're a clear canary in the coal mine in a new aquarium that you can just look at and know how well your tank is doing. Something that's important to understand about these corals is that they are notorious for going through pretty drastic color changes after receiving them in your aquarium and specifically ones that come from the wild will go through a really extreme color change within the first couple months of making it into captivity. So it's something to understand when you're buying these corals, specifically if you're buying a really nice looking strain online, that if it is something that's recently been imported from the wild, fragged up and is now being sold, there's a good chance the coral you end up with will look very different from the coral you're buying. Now, when it comes to recommending buying aquacultured coral or farmed coral over wild stuff, I'm as biased as they come, being someone who farms coral for a living. But 
I think there's a strong case to be made that you should be buying aquacultured Micromusa lordhoensis instead of wild ones, because ones that have been farmed in an aquarium have mostly gone through that color shift already, and while they certainly can go through a small color change from our system to yours, it's going to be a lot less drastic than the color change that you'll see going from the wild to a store's aquarium to your aquarium all within a month. Caring for a Micromusa lordhoensis tends to be fairly easy. They make for a good candidate as your first LPS coral. These corals do well in a low energy environment, that being low levels of light and not too much flow hitting the coral. In moderate to higher light environments, you're not going to get those nice fleshy polyps out of the coral. They'll recede into the skeleton and it'll just be obvious from looking at it that the coral isn't happy. Generally, these corals do very well at the bottom of the aquarium. You're looking for the dimly lit areas like an entrance to a cave or the edges of your rockwork in the corners of the tank. All of these low energy environments make for great places to put a garden of Micromusa lordhoensis. Just be careful when you're placing these corals that they're not in an area where they're going to be getting covered in sand as that will definitely upset and potentially kill them. They're seemingly unable to get most of the sand out of their polyps if it's constantly just being dumped into them by something like a sand sifting goby. These corals also do very well in dirtier tank conditions. Even in aquariums that I've tested and have considered to be way too dirty, I've seen Micromusa lordhoensis in there that are just thriving and look amazing. That's not to say that they actually require dirty water to thrive. They do well in clean water conditions as well. If you're running lower levels of nitrates and phosphates, you're probably going to want to be feeding the corals fairly frequently. Even in those dirtier water conditions, I would still be a proponent of feeding the corals. Usually I tell people to stop feeding their corals as soon as their nutrients get too high, but to see the real potential in Micromusa lordhoensis, you need to feed these corals. They color up a lot better, the polyps get much puffier, they grow a lot faster. Everything about these corals gets better when you're regularly feeding them and they just thrive with it. What you feed them probably doesn't matter too much. Typically you want to pick your foods based off of where you're trying to go with your nutrients. Most of what we're feeding these corals is Rhodomonas live phytoplankton, frozen calanus, frozen mysis, and fish pellets. We do this the majority of the time. If our nutrients tend to get a little bit higher than we'd like them, we'll stop feeding those and we'll switch to just feeding isocrisis live phytoplankton which will help bring the nutrients back down and we'll feed that until we're back where we want to be and then we'll go back to our regular frozen rhodomonas and pellet feedings for these corals. While these corals are definitely not going to be the fastest growing coral in your aquarium, with stable water chemistry and consistent feeding, you will watch this coral grow steadily and the larger the colony gets, the more noticeable this growth is gonna be. While you won't necessarily notice them while the colony is fully open and happy, as these corals grow, they will grow little baby polyps on the outer rim of the colony, typically hidden under the larger adult polyps. We find these baby polyps will slowly grow to become mature adult polyps in roughly two to three months. As they grow, they will start to get their own baby polyps on the outer rim of themselves, which then will grow into adult polyps as well. So as these colonies grow out, the growth is very much exponential, and eventually you get to a point where the colony will actually grow fairly fast. So be sure when placing them in your aquarium that you're giving them room to grow into nice, large, mature colonies. Sometimes when we see people creating their own Micromusa lordhoensis gardens, they place all the frags right side by side, which looks really cool when they grow out, but you'll never get to see any of them except for the ones on the outside of the garden grow into big colonies. I hope I've managed to teach you some things about Micromusa lordhoensis and hopefully help clear up some of the confusion with the taxonomy that the hobby is currently suffering from. If you want to see any of the strains that we currently have available, you can find them on our website, ndaquaculture.ca, 
or come by our coral farm in Edmonton to view them in person. If you liked this video, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and thanks for watching.